In this video, we'll discuss Tufti's graphical integrity rules. Now, if you haven't done the Tufti supplemental reading that's associated with this video, stop playing the video and go and do the reading first so that it will make sense because I'm not going to go into depth and detail on everything that's said in this chapter, but I'm going to give the highlights, all right? So Tufti sets up these rules that are what he calls the rules for graphical integrity. And these rules are designed to help you present the data with the highest fidelity. And by that, what I mean by that is that if we follow these rules, the effect in the data will be most appropriately represented in the graphic, all right? And our goal is to tell a story, the story, or a story of what is in the data using pictures, right? Fundamentally, that's what we're doing, right? And to tell that story graphically, we must work very hard to ensure that the size of the effect in the data is appropriately and accurately represented in the size of the effect in the graph. Now, we'll be working with Tableau, and most of the other tools also have no problem with this. And the fact that they don't allow us to really break a lot of these rules anymore, but you still can. A there are sev several of them that you'll see throughout where we can really mess up people's perception by breaking these rules. Now, I also, I'm not going to tell you that you'll never break one of these rules, but I want you to be aware of what happens to people's perception once you do. Edward Tufte is the guy who um, developed this. Um, he is a um, economist, emeritus from Yale, and he um, basically has made his living at data visualization for the last 40 years, since the 70s, right? Um, and these from that reading are the five rules. Now I'm gonna tell you, the first one is really the important one. It's minimize the lie factor because the lie factor is specifically how much the effect in the graph is not reflecting the effect in the data. These other four beneath it, the using consistent scale, standardizing units, etc., those, if we break them, create lie factor. So we have to really make sure we understand what's happening. The meta rule is don't create lie factor. The way you create lie factor is through breaking these other four rules and through some of the things we'll talk about um, in, the, in, in some of the other videos. All right? So the primary concern of high fidelity data visualization is to minimize the lie factor. And according to the reading, representations of numbers, meaning if it's one unit to two units, that's a 100% difference, the lines that represent one and two should be twice as long, right? So it basically says that the graph should be directly proportional to the numerical quantities represented. The lie factor is shows the size of the effect in the graphic over the size of the effect in the data. Now, if they are both 100%, the effect shown in the graphic is 100% change, the size of the effect in the data is 100% change, the lie factor will be one, which is good. You don't, you don't want any lie factor. But as we deviate from one, either below or above, we will see significant distortion of the data in how people are perceiving what the data is doing. The example from the book is this fuel economy standard um, graph. And we see here that this person who was creating this graph was focused on the picture of the road. I wanna make my graph look like this road. And so we have this forced perspective, the, the graph in the back for 1978 is further away, so it's narrower. The graph in the front for 1985 is wider. But as you read in the book, these lines are not proportional to the data. The difference between 18 and 27 are, is about 50%, right? Half of 18 is nine, 18 plus nine is 27, and the difference between 18 and 27 and a half is 53%. And we see here that the length of this line is clearly much, much shorter than 50% less, or I'm sorry, this, this longer line is much, much longer than 50% more of the length of this. Now, I will ask you to calculate the lie factor on an exam. 
but I won't ask you to like put a ruler up to the up to the screen. I will give you the measurements of everything you'll need to calculate. But I want you to know this calculation. We take the length of the effect and the graph. We take the effect and the graph first, right? So the effect and the graph is the length of the second line minus the length of the first line or box or whatever it is that we're calculating over the original value times 100. That's 783%. We do the same thing for what the data is. It's 27.5 minus 18 over 18 times 100. That's 53%. We take that ratio. We said that this live factor is 14.8. And what does that mean? It means that the graphic is showing a, an effect that is 14.8 times more than the data effect that we have. So that means that we're distorting this data 14 and a half times or 14.8 times. And Tufty's example of a more high fidelity graph is just a simple line graph with a little bit of annotation and decoration. And it does, it shows that there's these standards and it shows with proper uh, changes in length, the appropriate length of the lines that reflects the effect in the data. Here's another example. And this is an example of one of the meta rules we'll talk about later. Uh, now, this is, of course, you know, we're not going to see this in business, but you might have ca have customers who say, I want you to make it more peppy and I want you to make it cooler than just bar charts. So you might be tempted to say, OK, let me get a graphic and then I'll make it bigger uh, if when it gets bigger. And we see here that in May there were about 13 f adult frogs in the South Pond. And by September, there was about 39. Now, what's the effect in that data, 13 to 39, it's about a, what, 200% change, right? But what about the difference in size? Now, the problem here is that we're actually changing the size of the frog in two dimensions. And so we're squaring the change in the data rather than simply linearly representing it. We'll talk more about that later. And one way you could possibly represent that better is by stacking the frogs, right? But by doing changes in two dimensions rather than one data dimension, one dimension, we create lie factor. All right. Now, here's a great example of what you might see in an exam where you're going to see some a, a graphic that's a real life graphic put up. And I'm going to say calculate the lie factor. And in this one, I'm going to say calculate the lie factor between the Shanghai negative 21.9 percent and the Sensex negative 12.2 percent. Now, again, you see that I've got a height and a width for each one of these, and I would just ask you to calculate it. So go back to your book or the previous slides. The slides are all posted and take a look, calculate that lie factor. So the first thing you have to do is calculate the area of each of these. And then you've got to look at what the data effect is and figure out the lie factor. Now I'm going to let you stop the video here and then I'll show you how it would be done. So the first thing we do is we calculate the area. For Shanghai, it's 1.725. It's 1 1.5 times 1.15. The Sensex area is 0.54 times 0.58, and it's 0.3132. And then it's simply calculate the equation the way that we, um, we, we saw it on the previous graph. The, the visual effect is 4.51 times smaller. So Centex is 4.51 times smaller than Shanghai, or Shanghai is 4.51 times bigger. The actual effect is that Shanghai is 0.79 or 79% bigger. We take 4.51, we divide it by 0.79, and we get 5.71. So the lie factor in this graph is 5.71. Now, if, you, if you're not clear on how that was calculated, Go back to the reading and read through it again and make sure you're very clear on this because this is a key, key factor, a key, key concept for this class. So in short, we want to minimize that lie factor. Now, the way that we do that is to follow these remaining rules that you read about. So the first one is consistent scales. And what Tufti says is a scale moving in regular intervals. 
is expecting to keep those regular intervals. So if an inch means one, an inch always means one. If, a, if 10 pixels means one, 10 pixels always means one, etc. right? So this would be a incorrect way of doing consistent scales on the bottom, right? The top is clearly consistent scales. Each of those inches is one unit. But in the bottom, we see that it's one, then it's four, then it's one, then it's five. And you'll be surprised how often people don't realize that they're doing this, right? If their data isn't um, recorded at, at, at regular intervals and they don't use a tool that understands dates, this can happen rel relatively easily in things like Excel, right? So scales should be consistent for the duration of the measurement presented, right? So if we're going from one to a million, that scale should be consistent, whether it's by 10 million at a time or whatever, right? And so here's the example from um, Tufty where we have these um, measurements that are at really different, sca uh, uh, different scales, eight years, then four years, then two years, then eight years, then two years, etc. And it makes it look like those two lines are relatively consistent. The doctors go up uh, at a consistent rate. The other ones go at a consistent rate. But when we see that, I mean, so this is the implication that they're going at pr relatively linear rates. But as you saw in the reading, that's clearly not true, right? So after Medicare began, those angles really shifted for the doctors and didn't really shift uh, below. Just by spacing out the points um, to their actual distance apart, we see some new insight that we lost when we didn't have the consistent scales. Now, the next rule is using standardized monetary values in Tufty, but it's really standardized any values. Um, we will look at examples um, later on where we're looking at what happens when we don't, for instance, um, standardize by population or gross domestic product or things like that. And we will learn that standardizing values is really, really important in this world of interconnectedness that we live in now. We can't compare wages in Bangladesh with wages in the United States on absolute terms. In some areas of the world, $6.50 a day is a fortune. And we have to really just be sure that we understand that standardizing is the key to telling stories that are not creating lie factor. So in time series, when we're talking about money, for instance, if we're talking about um, some sort of money spend by year, we will generally do that by deflating the dollars in every year to the first year's dollars. So if we're talking about government spending from 2000 to 2020, we will express that in 2000, year 2000 dollars. But again, when making comparisons, all values should be standardized, whether it's GDP by, by population or AIDS deaths by 100,000 population, et cetera, right? And we'll look at extensive examples of this moving forward. And here's just that example where you see that it looks like this, this uh, budget is kind of growing out of control, but when you standardize per capita in constant dollars, it did grow, but then it re remained relatively flat for the next seven years. Now, presenting data in context is really important. Um, you see here from this example that clearly in this graph, there's some lie factor because we didn't start the y-axis at zero before strict reinforcement looks like it was at 325. And because the line goes almost all the way to the x-axis, the after stricter enforcement looks like it was like nearly 100% reduction. And we have to really go look at that scale on the left to understand that. But the other thing that's important to understand is that in order to say that something is caused by something else, you have to show enough data from before the supposed cause in order to convince someone that the cause is what shifted the line. So if we look at this in more context, now that, that, that argument that stricter enforcement is what reduced traffic deaths is 
probably less likely to be un understood as being true simply because it looks like 1955 was kind of an outlier, right? And also, this is not standardized by population. This is just the total number of deaths. It is likely that the population of Connecticut in 1959 was higher than it was in 1951. And so comparing this in absolute numbers is actually misleading. It's probably even lower in 1959 compared with 1951 than this graph shows. And then when you show the surrounding states context, we really see that well, look, there was this outlier in Connecticut and Rhode Island in 1955. What might be causing that? And the, the reality is, is that Rhode Island and Connecticut are right on the coast. Their entire geography is um, affected by storms, whereas New York and Massachusetts have a lot more of their land masses that aren't necessarily affected by storms from the ocean. And you can see that would be a compelling or at least a, a, a rational argument for why there's that difference in shape between Connecticut and Rhode Island versus New York and uh, Massachusetts. And you do see here that once this has been standardized by deaths per 100,000, this difference in 1951 and the difference in 1959 is, is a substantially more. In the original graph, it looked like it was a little bit lower, but in here, it's a lot lower. And finally, show the data above all else. Um, now, this is something that we don't really have to worry about in the world of modern data visualization programs like Tableau and Microsoft BI, Power BI, et cetera. Um, he was looking at this from, a, from the perspective of when we had to draw a lot of our graphs. And we wanted to make sure we had a, a data ink ratio where the proportion of the graphic um, of the ink or the pixels on a computer screen that's devoted to data should be nearly 100%, right? So let's say we used 100 pixels on this graph. The data ink ratio would be how many of those pixels are actually data ink versus decoration ink. And he uses this example. And obviously, we're not in a world anymore where we're drawing and um, placing dots on graph paper. And when we do something like this in Tableau or Power BI, it's gonna look a lot more like this. Now where Tufty and I kind of disagree is he says that the axes and the trend line are not data ink. And he's the guy and he came up with the concept and he's allowed to define it any way he wants. But I don't feel that, that that's necessarily um, something we should be worried about. We should provide trend lines and axes because without those things, people can't interpret the data, right? So we would see that there was some sort of presumably upward trend if we didn't have axes, but we couldn't necessarily um, understand you know, what, what those values really meant without the axes. Anyway, so again, Tufty says the axes and the grid lines are, and the um, trend lines aren't data ink. I, I kind of disagree with him, but we won't ever have you know, debates about that moving forward. All right. In summary, we want to minimize the lie factor and these other four rules that we've discussed and we're co covered in much more detail in the reading. Um, if we break them, we will create lie factor. And so most of these rules, Tableau and Power BI and Click and all these other um, visualization tools are very aware of. Um, and so to break them, you have to kind of try, but you can do it. And so we want to make sure that we understand why it's so important to not break these rules, because we are creating a picture that is not properly representing what the data shows. All right, that's enough for now.